All right, this is the part. Oh, I said all right again. Dang it. Scrap the video. <laughs> okay, this is the this is the portion of the video where I do selected homework problems. So when you're stuck, find the corresponding problem in the video and watch it. I would not recommend just watching this video all the way through. Um, although I'm sure it's high quality entertainment if you'd like to. We're going to start with 68, which is a copy of not a copy, but very similar to the homework pro the problems from the first video. These are the really fun ones where we have uh, a ream on sum with n pieces. And as n goes to infinity, this approach is an integral. And the question is, what integral does it become? Okay, so here, L sub n, let's just copy this down, is, 2 pi over n times the sum, i goes from 1 to n, of 2 pi times i minus 1 over n times cosine of 2 pi i minus 1 over n. Now, I kind of said this earlier, and I'd like to say it again, that for these sorts of problems, really, the more complicated they are, I think the easier they are to see what's going on. Because think about what we were doing before. We said, what's our goal? We said our goal is that, okay, we know the integral from A to B of some function with respect to X is the limit, as N goes to infinity, of these L sub Ns. And these L sub Ns were the sum from I equals 1 to N of F of x sub i minus 1. If it was l, it was i minus 1. And if it was r, it was just i. Okay, or the definition of the Riemann sum is we use the star. The star meant it doesn't actually matter whether it's left or right. But here's left specifically, times delta x. Then we just match things up. Okay, let's just do things one at a time. And just like before, this would appear to be our delta x. And just like before, we're going to write out our theories, what we're expecting, what we're thinking, and then constantly make sure that it doesn't contradict what we've thought before, because this, this is not always obvious. So I think that delta x, let's do it in blue. I think that delta x is going to be 2 pi over n. So if there are n rectangles, and each rectangle has width 2 pi over n, what do you think the width of the interval is? The width of the interval should be 2 pi. Width of the interval is b minus a. We don't know what b is yet. We don't know what a is yet. But the width of that interval should be b minus a. All right. And then what's left over? Well, I mean, the, the sum is the sum. We're already taking the limit as n goes to infinity. So really, this green guy is the same as that green guy. So we have to guess. It really is a guess what x sub i minus 1 is. But once we make our guess, that's going to tell us two other things, and then we can really see whether we're right. So the green things have to be identical. So let's write that down. This green thing has to equal that green thing. Unless we've made a mistake, which is possible, and then we'll have to choose a different green thing. But we're assuming that these green things are the same. So if that's the case, what do you think is the x sub i minus 1? And there's a couple options for this. You could guess this. You could guess this. Those are both good options. Why? Because they both pop up twice. Only one of them is correct. And this is what tells us which one is correct. Because we know the width of the interval has to be 2 pi. So I'm going to guess it's going to be the whole thing. 
2 pi i minus 1 over n. Now let's look. If that's indeed our x sub i minus 1, which will eventually lead us to telling us directly what our function is, then what's our first piece? If i is equal to 1, if i is equal to 1, we get x sub 0 is 1 minus 1 over n. 1 minus 1 is 0. This all zeroes out. And what's our last one? Our last piece is when i is equal to n, so we get n minus 1. y is n, we get 2 pi. I'm running out of room, aren't I? Times n minus 1 over n. As n goes to infinity, as n goes to infinity, what does this become? Well, this part becomes 1, and we get 2 pi. So as n goes to infinity, we're in, our interval is looking like 0 to 2 pi. Good. 0 to 2 pi is the right interval length. That's what we're looking for. So it's not contradicting itself yet. And then the function should, uh, should really be the same function up here. But instead of x sub i minus 1, it should be x. So everywhere that we have an x sub i minus 1, we're switching that to an x. So that guy's an x, and that guy's an x. Now all of these should be consistent. If I plug in, if I replace all the x's with x sub i minus 1's, I replace all these x's with x sub i minus 1. We should get this first guy. And indeed we do. Now we have all the information we need. Our answer is the integral from a, which is that first thing, to b, which is the end, as n goes to infinity. There's another way of finding this b value, but this is one of them of the function, which we said was x times cosine of x, dx. And there's some cool ways of visualizing this, too. I don't know if I really want to get into it. Um, all right, give me a minute, a minute to do this. Can we do the integral from 0 to pi of x cosine of x, dx? It's 0. Oh, Jason, did you make a mistake? Why is it zero? Well, let's look at the function. What does x cosine of x look like between zero and two pi? I'm saying that this integral, which is the net signed area, is zero. So what that, what that claim turns out to be is that this area plus this area has to be the same as this negative area, which looks plausible. I don't know if it's true, but it looks plausible. They look about the same, right? This first area plus this last area is about the same as this negative area, so it cancels each other out. The total area is a bigger number. And in fact, but the net signed area is zero. Remember, we can find the total area by adding absolute values. So the total area is about 12 and a half. Oh, interesting. Now let's see if we indeed have this integral being the limit of this sum. Let's say uh, the sum is going to be 2 pi over n. And I'm going to add a slider for n. It's 2 pi over m times the sum. n goes from, ooh. Okay, Desmos defaults this to n, which is really unfortunate. I think I can change it to i of these L sub n's. These L sub n's are 2 pi over n times 2 pi times i minus 1 over n.
times the cosine of 2 pi, the same thing. Okay. Um, this is interesting. Okay. So if we use one rectangle, oh goodness, you can slow down, slow down, slow down. Oh, there's some cool stuff you can do this. Uh, anyway, I need more practice with that. Um, let's look from n goes from zero to a thousand. Step is one, and then we'll play it. So as n is increasing, what's happening to this Riemann sum? As n is increasing, what's happening to the Riemann sum? It's negative. But as we're drawing more and more rectangles, and I'm not, I haven't actually shown the pictures, but look at, we're adding more and more rectangles to this. Should be approaching this definite integral. In fact, it is. And we could change things very slightly. If we change a sine to a cosine, if we change this sine to a cosine, it should have the same thing happen. Now, as we add more and more triangles, it should, should approach this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. F playing a little bit. Uh, what happened here? Uh, um, uh, <laughs> All right. I don't know what happened when I... Changed it. I modified it. I tried to modify it and show something cool. But uh, I think I missed something and I'm not sure what I missed. And I'm not going to spend this video forever. I just wanted to show something cool. Uh, but I'm sure I just clicked, uh, clicked the wrong button here. Curious what it is. I'll go back and find it later. Maybe I'll make a comment above the video. In fact, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Okay. So that was 68. Here's 72. Oh, I, I need to tab back to 72. Okay. Evaluate the integrals of the function's graph using the formulas for areas and circles and subtracting the areas below the x-axis. So we're looking at integrals here, right? So integrals is net signed area. So it's going to be this positive area minus this area plus this last area. So this first area is a semicircle of radius 1. So it's going to be one half by, excuse me, times the radius squared. The second area, which we're going to subtract, is a triangle with base four and height two. We're going to subtract that one. And the third area is a semicircle. Well, the middle is nine. Semicircle of radius three. Okay, so one half i times the radius squared. And so our, our integral of whatever function this is from 0 to 12 is just going to be the first area minus the second area plus the third area. So one half pi minus 4. plus 9 halves pi. We'll get 10 halves, or 5 pi minus 4. And you could find a decimal approximation for this if you'd like as well. All right, 78. Evaluate the integral. Integral from negative 3 to 3 of 3 minus the absolute value of x dx. And we can graph this because we know what an absolute value function looks like. 
All right, an absolute value function just looks like a V. We're flipping that V upside down. And, uh, oh, that's not straight. We're flipping the V upside down and then adding three. What we have is uh, something like this. This is straight, yes. And we're looking at the integral from negative three to positive three. We're looking at this blue area. Since it's all positive, total area in this case is going to be the same as net signed area. And if you'd like, you could see this on Desmos as well to really uh, make sure you're good. Actually, I'm going to open up a new Desmos because I want to save that for myself for later. Uh, 3 minus the absolute value of x should look exactly like we've graphed. Well, this is an area of a triangle. Area of a triangle is 1 half, the base, times the height. There it is, 9. And if you really want to be great, it's going to be 9 units squared for area. But usually for definite integrals, we're just going to write 9. You can always ask um, whether I want units or not on something, if I'm ever unclear. I haven't talked too much about the subtleties of this section. So a good question to ask. Let's do 90. Suppose, oh, it's another one of these guys. Suppose the integral from 0 to 4, this function, dx, the dx is important, is 5. The integral from 0 to 2 of the function is negative 3. Oh, negatives. Integral from 0 to 4 of another function is negative 1. And the integral from 0 to 2 of that other function is positive 2. Forgot my dx again. And then in number 90, we're looking for the integral from 0 to 2 of f minus g. This one's much easier than it could be. Remember, you just use your properties of in, you just use your properties of integrals to try to get it in terms of these guys. Remembering that you might have to flip the directions and add a negative. And uh, it doesn't actually matter where the function's positive or not. This is just going to integral from zero to two of the first function minus the integral from zero to two of the second function. Well, the first function from zero to two is negative three. The second is positive two. So we just get negative three minus positive two, negative five. Last problem. And I know there are some more complicated questions, but those are good for like discussion threads and in class discussion. Um, there's some really kind of wacky problems at the end of this assignment that are kind of uh, really fun. Use the identity. So this is that last identity that you can break up an integral into two pieces. So it wants you to break up this integral from negatives to zero and from zero to the positive inputs to compute these things. Compute the integral from negative pi to pi of sine of t over one plus t squared dt. So it's telling us how to start. It says start by writing it like this, pi to zero, sine of t over one plus t squared, plus the integral from zero to t of the same thing. All right, so the idea is, if we're thinking about areas, what happens if t is negative? Well, if t is negative, it's exactly the same as if t is positive. For the denominator, we're squaring away the negative. If t is negative, that doesn't matter. And if t is negative here, what happens? Remember that sine is an odd function. 
That's the hint here. Sine is an odd function. A negative on the inside is the same as a negative on the outside. So look what we can do with this. Let's, look, let's just look at this first part for a second, and then we'll worry about the second part. This should not be a T. Up here? That's pi. So this first part, we can, uh, we can switch the limits of integration if we wanted from zero to negative pi using one of our properties. And now we can put that negative inside. Uh, let's not write the equal sign right there. The negative inside is going to be zero to negative pi of negative sine of t over one plus t squared. Oh, I wrote an integral twice. It's really getting late in the day. And we'll use the fact that sine is odd. Yeah, this is negative sine, sorry, sine of negative t over one plus t squared. Why does this help us? Helps us if we do a little substitution. Zero to negative pi, the negatives are already canceled out here because it's an odd function. And in fact, this whole thing is an odd function because it's an odd function times an even function. We could actually have shown that this whole thing was an odd function as well. to jump to the answer in a different way, which is honestly what the thing that I think is the easiest way to approach this problem. But uh, the book kind of wants you to apply it this way. All right, so we can just replace all the negative t's. And in fact, if we really want to be special, we can do it like this too. t squared is the same thing as negative t squared. Place all the positives with negatives and get Oh no, we were supposed to do that before this point. Dang it. No, that's not, that's not what, what we wanted to do here. I think the best way of doing this problem really is the one I was saying earlier, where sine is odd anyway. So whatever this area is, this area is going to be the opposite because it's odd. Right. Specifically, if we call this function right over here, if our integrand is a sine of t over 1 plus t squared, that's our integrand, the function that's being integrated, I want to show you that this is indeed also odd. Because if we plug in negative t here, what do we get out? Replace all the t's with negative t's, including parentheses where you need to. Well, on the top, sine is odd, so this becomes that. And on the bottom, when we square it, it goes away. So this is indeed odd. So what does that mean graphically for us here? Who knows what this function looks like? But whatever it is in that first quadrant, if it's odd, that means it has to be reflected about the origin. No matter what the shape looks like, we're going to have that. So if we have some positive and some negative over here, that means we're going to have equal parts negative and positive respectively over there. But because it's odd, we have this situation. So the integral from negative pi to pi of this function has to equal zero. And I think that's probably the easier way, way to approach this problem. I was off by a negative the first way that I was doing it. And instead of finding the negative, I decided to take the way that I thought made more sense. Okay, so that's the uh, selected homework problems video. Let me know if you have any extra questions. The video is over here. If you want to kind of see the way that I problem solve, see the way that I go through 
other things you can stick around, but the video is basically done. Because I just want to go back to this and, and see, uh, see really what was happening when I changed this to a sign. How come these didn't agree? And my gut is that, uh, my gut is that it was just like some sort of replacing issue. But I'm not sure. So it should be a negative answer. So I believe this, this negative answer is probably correct. Of, um, I think that's negative two pi exactly. And the question is what's going on with this, this piece over here? I think I might just add the slider over again. I think I think this still has the same same issue. No, it doesn't. Yeah, I think it is just a bug with Desmos and the slider. Nope. No, it wasn't. Interesting. Then there's something wrong with this ream on sum here, where I change this to x sine x, and this is not x sine x anymore. But again, I really thought it was. Let me just go through and make sure 2 pi over n times the sum. We don't want n. i equals 1 to n up there of 2 pi over n times two pi times i minus one over n. I just want to retype it and make sure it's working right. Sine of two pi divided by, or times i minus one over n. No, it looks like they're the same. Ah. Oh. Interesting, I wonder why these Riemann sums are not the same when Oh, it's because I have an extra 2 pi. That's what it is. That's why it's going to 0. The 2 pi was originally written in the front. Then I put it inside because that's where we usually see it in that notation. So we had an extra n in the denominator. So if something is, is approaching a number... And then we're dividing it by n, which is going to infinity. Something approaching a number divided by something approaching infinity will always equal zero. And now you can actually see that this number is very quickly approaching the integral, which is what we wanted. So yeah, it was just that extra 2 pi over n. Maybe you saw it. I hope you saw it. That'd be great. That would make me happy. Um, yeah, but if you're curious, that's kind of the thought process. Here are the extra problems. Good luck in your problems and uh, let me know if you have questions. Bye-bye.